Okay, welcome to uh, this webinar, another installment of our Firestarter Chats series. And this one is really special. We have some very special guests. <laughs> Uh, to talk about their work as a radical Jewish podcast. And you'll both have to turn your uh, mics on, Sam and David. Hello. Hello, David. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't hear you for a sec. Hello. <laughs> thanks for having us and describing us as very special. Indeed, thanks for being with us. I, I really just wanted to play, I wanted to have an excuse to play the, the, the Trey theme music at the, the beginning of this. Um, so uh, before we launch into talking about the TRAFE podcast, uh, I wanted to just talk a little bit about uh, IJV, Independent Jewish Voices, and, and the work we do, and, and basically why we're doing events like this. So uh, for those of you who know us, or maybe some of you joining us don't know us, uh, Independent Jewish Voices is a national Jewish organization here in Canada. And uh, we've been around since 2008. Uh, and we are an organization that engages in anti-racist, anti-colonial solidarity. So, uh, you know, over the years, our, our prime focus has been Palestine solidarity and working in support of the Palestinian freedom struggle. We were the first national Jewish organization in Canada to support uh, the BDS call it boycotts, divestments and sanctions in solidarity with the Palestinian people. And so a lot of our work is still focused around that. But we also do indigenous solidarity work here in Canada. We do anti-racist work uh, and really drawing on that Jewish tradition of not in our name, that Jewish tradition of tikkun olam and mending the world. And so if you are Jewish and if you're curious to know more about our work, uh, or if you're not Jewish and if you want to support our work, I would encourage you to go to our website, which is ijvcanada.org. You can sign up for our newsletter. And also, if you've been uh, attending some of these webinars, we've, we've had some amazing events this month. Uh, just this past Tuesday, we had the incredible Palestinian Shamstep Band 47 Soul on. Uh, if you missed that, that's up on our website and our Facebook page. You can, uh, you can watch the video. Um, but if you enjoy these webinars, these webinars are always free for people to attend, but they aren't free to put on. And so if you can support us in, in, in any way, in any capacity, whether it's $5, $10, $20, uh, you can go to our website, ijvcanada.org slash donate uh, and make a donation there. I did really want to mention uh, one quick thing that came up today uh, that we're working on. This is a big part of our work is uh, over the past year, we've been involved in a campaign against the IHRA, which is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance and their redefinition of anti-Semitism, which is essentially designed to conflate anti-Semitism with legitimate criticism of Israel and, and anti-Zionism. And, and so Ontario right now is trying to pass a bill, Bill 168, which is designed to write the IHRA into law in Ontario. Uh, it's a really frightening, it's a really dangerous thing because not only is it dangerous for Jews by conflating anti-Semitism with criticism of Israel and anti-Zionist activism, but it's of course dangerous for our Palestinian uh, allies too, uh, where it could censor and delegitimize their freedom struggle. And so I want people again to go to our website, I, uh, sorry, ijvcanada.org. You can find information about this campaign. We have a link where you can click a button and send an email to all the MPPs uh, in Ontario to voice your opposition. Uh, also, just quickly before we jump into this discussion with Trafe today, uh, we have one more event after this in the same series. This is called the Firestarter Chat Series. And so we have one more event, which is exactly one week today. Uh, we're going to be having the incredible Palestinian poet and spoken word artist Rafif Ziada is going to be joining us for uh, a Firestarter Chat. That's going to be at 1 p.m. Eastern time on October the 29th. And again, you can sign up for that by going to our website at ijvcanada.org slash firestarterchats. 
and uh, you'll find the, uh, the registration link there. We'll post some of these in the chat in just a little bit. So let's jump into our event today. And uh, Sam and David, if you could both turn your, uh, your cameras back on. Hello. <laughs> so uh, Sam Vick and David Zinman are both joining us from uh, unceded Ganyagahaga territory in Montreal, where I am as well. And uh, they are the hosts of Traif, an anarchist Jewish podcast uh, recorded, as you guys always say, under the giant cross of secularism on Matt Royal. And uh, it, it's an absolutely fabulous podcast. Um, perhaps some people good. joining us have already heard it. Maybe you haven't. You can go to their website, trafepodcast.com. The show features uh, discussions about radical leftist politics and history, highlighting perspectives often excluded from mainstream Jewish spaces. And uh, we're going to get into it today, talking a little bit about uh, your, your raison d'être of the show. So thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thanks for bringing us on. Thanks, Aaron. It's, it feels nice to know that there's someone like you in the position that you're in right now at IJV. It's, it's cool. So thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. And, and I'm really glad we could set this up because, you know, I think um, the, the work that you're doing with Trafe is so like emblematic and, and representative, I want to say, of you know, the broader Jewish left and the work that we're, we're trying to do every day uh, in IJV. So, um, so, so it's incredible to, to, to have Trafe out there in the world and to be doing this event. Uh, oh, I also want to introduce um, our, our co-moderator today who's going to be moderating the Q&A. So she's going to be jumping on in a little bit. We have Emily Green, who is a member of uh, IJV at York University, uh, joining us from Toronto. Hey, Emily. So uh, Emily will be uh, coming back in a little bit to, to take questions from the audience. So if you do have questions uh, for Sam and David, just hang on to them. We will get to that in just a little bit. Um, first of all, I guess just to ask like, how, how are you guys doing? How have you been hanging in there in these weird pandemic times? Yeah, David, you want to take it away? Uh, sure. I mean, I don't have a, I, I, like I'm pretty lucky all things considered like you know, like I, I, I have an apartment with uh, like roommates who I'm very close to and are very caring, thoughtful people. And uh, I'm in, you know, pretty good uh, situation, all things considered. Like a lot of people are in very difficult situations right now, um, uh, especially like people without status uh, who don't have any support. Um, there's been a lot of political work to support them where we live um, through a lot of mutual aid efforts. But um, I don't know, like I, I have like an autoimmune condition, so I can't, I have to be really careful. Like I can't leave my apartment a lot. Um, so just a lot of apartment time, uh, me and Sam can't record the podcast together anymore, which is really weird. Uh, we have to do it like in some version of this. Uh, so it's taken some getting used to it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, very strange time in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. On my end, I don't know. Um, I think I'm doing pretty okay. All things considered. I'm a big fan of the season. The fall colder weather does does well for me, and uh, yeah, I mean, like David said, luckily family's good. I'm relatively, or no, I'm more than good. I'm good, and uh, yeah, uh, I'm happy to be chatting. Yeah, it, I mean, COVID has been funny in a way. I mean, it's it's been devastating. It hasn't been funny, but it's just interesting how uh, with COVID, a lot of people talk about podcasts and podcasting more and more, and it's been kind of this time where you know, for a lot of people, it's opened up a lot of free time, right? Like people who've maybe had to go on unemployment or on the CERB benefits here in Canada, and then have said, hey, maybe now is the time that I want to make this podcast I've always thought about making, um, or just having more time to listen to podcasts. Um, I don't know, has, has that been the experience for either of you, even like necessarily having more time to work on the podcast or just having more time to listen to podcasts? Shmulek, you, you want to do this? Um, I feel like how much I listen to podcasts is a whole other conversation that I would love <laughs> to talk to you about, Aaron, but this is probably not the, the, the venue to do that. I know you're a big radio head as well. Um, yeah, I think there's so, I think we've kind of unexamined the impact of listening to so many podcasts in, in, in the day-to-day, -day, but like that's a whole other conversation. Um, I think we've kind of been keeping the same pace. Um, we have a few series that we're working on 
and we're trying to kind of engage deeper with issues as opposed to just responding to news uh, on a monthly basis, let's say. So we've been kind of just trying to like keep ch like chugging along with what we had set out. And I think the pandemic has both, yeah, the pandemic has given us time, but also we're not rushing through anything really. Mm -hmm. And I mean, David, I know with you, you're um, extremely methodical in, in the way you work. Um, I've had a <laughs> To work with David. Uh, David and I did a, a radio documentary for CBC together a few winters back. Um, and, this and becomes the Eric of the grievances. <laughs> no, it's not. No, 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 no. I mean, this this was a, a very fun time in my life. Um, getting to work with you on that, where um, we are spending a lot of time outside in minus 30 weather uh, down at the U.S. Canadian border, uh, documenting. Um, refugees who were coming across at the rocks and road crossing uh, into Canada. And, um, and then, and then David, you were doing a lot of editing for that documentary. And I just remember like, you know, I mean, some podcasters like myself, a lot of us hate editing, but you're very much like, you're going to sit down, you're going to edit out every little mm and ah. Uh, <laughs> so in the pandemic, have you had more time to, I guess, bring that methodical touch to, to trade? Yeah, I mean, I'd be, I I would love to hear both of you talk about this tendency that I, I bring to this work, but um, uh, yeah, like, so I do, I, I do a lot of uh, that editing work on the show, um, and one thing, and no, during the pandemic, uh, I've maxed, I max out my screen time every day, so it's a question of, like, what am I going to get in? What is the work I'm going to get in? Um, uh, I would say for me, like the, the editing is most of the work that I put into the show, uh, like in terms of how workflow look or like how workflow looks, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and so it can just become this sort of never ending mountain of work that you always have edits that you have to do. You always have like 10 interviews sitting around waiting for you to edit them so you can release them. Um, and so thankfully, Sam, is, I feel like in a lot of ways, Sam is like the engine of the show. Um, whereas like, you know, always coming up with ideas, like always pushing us forward. And sometimes I can be like the cranky breaks of the show. <laughs> like, oh, there's so much editing work to do. Um, but yeah, that's definitely, definitely still the approach that I was taking in that doc is, is, is coming out day to day with the show, I think. It's kind of like the, the unsung heroism, I think, of podcasting, because it's really what makes podcasts sound good is uh, is editing and having that invisible hand to to go through and to, to clean everything up but uh, I'm getting Aaron to... yes can we add it makes such a difference like for people I don't know for people if anyone's listening who is trying to make radio like editing really really like you can it makes a tremendous difference focus on that if you can indeed indeed yeah yeah because I mean there's so many podcasts out there that just sound awful too right where it's just like um one dude talking for two hours completely unedited and uh and i really wish there was someone like david there who was gonna go in and clean it up but um oh, yeah wow. lucrative field <laughs> <laughs> i'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because i wanted to i wanted to kind of bring it back to the beginning and talk okay. a little bit about what trafe is for people who are unfamiliar with the show i introduced it in the beginning um but Sam, let, let, let's start with you maybe. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, bring us back to the beginning and tell us how you came up with the idea for Trafe. I will do my best. And if I am um, mistelling or misremembering parts of history or if there are conflicting accounts, David, please feel free. Um, yeah, we can do the way we usually talk or we just keep going back and forth. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, so 2014, I think, were you involved in this, Aaron, that, that action at the mm -hmm. Federation building? Uh, you'll have to remind me. So it was, um, I think, cast. It was cast led, like the summer that Israel uh, bombed Gaza in 2014, I believe. And um, a bunch of anarchist slash anarchist adjacent Jews in Montreal were trying to figure out what to do, and there was a decision to organize an action at the Federation Building. Um, and so David and I kind of. Oh, and then, so following that, a bunch of us kept meeting together to talk about anarchism, Jews. Are we going to organize together? Are we not? What are we going to do? And then, um, and then um, David and I kind of 
got together on this based on a question of like liking radio, loving radio and like wanting to make radio and thinking that we could make good radio, which was obviously a lie at that point. Um, <laughs> it took us a very long time. But we thought that we could, um, we thought that we could put out uh, narrative driven audio stories like those feature length takes so much time to organize and put together six or seven people like huge staff um anyway so we thought we could do that and that combined with kind of the politics angle was how we came together or, or how the show came together in five four or five years five or six years ago well we, we started working on it uh in the spring of 2014 so it's been over six years now uh, okay. i think um, and, and, and our first collaboration was working, uh, doing media for that action. Uh, and it just worked so well that it sort of bled into what the show became. And it, I mean, it's interesting. So, so around that time, um, I was actually working as the, the news coordinator at CKUT radio, which is uh, our wonderful campus community radio station here in Montreal. And, um, it, it was funny because Trafe, you know, Sam and David were always around CKUT recording the show there. And CKUT is very much, um, you know, traditional, what we call terrestrial radio, right? So it goes out over the FM airwaves and it's radio that's really designed to be live. So you're, you're actually tuning into a show at a, a specific time. And then, and then Trafe comes along and it was one of the first shows there who was kind of like, no, 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 we're not interested in the whole radio thing. <laughs> we're really a podcast and so was, was there any reason I guess why you kind of eschewed that whole radio thing where like specifically we want to do this as a podcast well one reason is that like I'm as, as you know Aaron I'm really bad with live radio like Sam like Sam is much better uh at it so just in terms of skill set like um I'm much more comfortable in environments uh where like in our, like when we do interviews, it's a very forgiving medium, right? Like we're having a conversation with somebody and you can say anything, you can restate a, a, something you said, uh, you can scrap a question, you can have a side conversation and it all gets edited out. But on live radio, the take's the take. Um, and uh, as people who are new to it, it felt a lot more comfortable to do it through podcasting. But also, yeah, I don't know, the, 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 the uh, podcasts that we both, like everything that we were listening to were also podcasts and there are things that were highly edited. And so that's what we were sort of reaching toward. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add yeah. to that? Well, I mean, I just want to, first of all, I'm sure most people listening are big fans of CQT, but just shout out to CQT. It's, uh, it's really amazing in so many ways and has like really spawned so much important on like radio, but also organizing and different stuff like that. Um, yeah, that was kind of the that was that was the only piece I wanted to add there. I <laughs> yeah, agree. we were um, we didn't really fit with the CKT approach at the moment. Like we were kind of yeah. sneaking in the side door, literally, uh, to book a studio uh, and just record what we were doing and edit it. Uh, and it wasn't really set up for that, so it led to some misunderstandings <laughs> at certain I, times. But people there were very supportive uh, as time went on. Yeah, mm -hmm. the other thing is, I think the goal of the show from the beginning was not to be a necessarily a Montreal show. Um, it felt like we were trying to have a conversation. It's hard to not speak in cliches when you're talking about radio and connecting with people, but we were trying to create like a, a network or a conversation or a discussion with people throughout North America in some ways, I think. And it would just be harder to do if it was just only on CQT. And so like kind of the point was creating audio that people could listen to anywhere pretty accessibly. Because mm -hmm. um, the number of those people aren't uh, tremendous, so uh, <laughs> that's uh, like linking linking all those like two thousand, five thousand people up together was kind of what we had in mind. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I apologize for bringing you guys into the liveness uh, of this, <laughs> and uh, definitely outside of our comfort zone. Yeah, we actually have one uh, hilarious comment um, from Gordon, who's who's uh, tuning in, and uh, he says he's been subscribing to Trey for a few years and he's really pleased to be able to see what Sam and David look like. Oh, right. Hello over the internet. Thank you for listening for so long. Hello, hello. I, I, I'd be curious to know if people thought that uh, or had other impressions of what Sam and David might look like. 
uh, the <laughs> eternal mysteries of the uh, yeah of the voice. Also, like quick tip, you can Google it. I feel like you can probably <laughs> figure out both pretty easy. But yeah. do some detective work on the internet. <laughs> so again, kind of like going back to the, the earlier days of, of trade, which was really funny for me because again, being around CKUT, and I should say like CKUT is an incredible and, and very like diverse radio station. So it's it's tucked into like a rather small building that used to be a university residence. Um, you have to walk up a very steep street kind of going up Mount Royal to get to it. Uh, and then the booth where you guys used to record the show and where I imagine you were probably recording up until recently. Now you can't obviously because of COVID. Yeah. Um, we have this tiny little recording booth that in the winter is way too cold and in the summer is like ungodly hot. There's just like no way to cool it down. It's also not soundproofed. <laughs> it's not soundproof. So if anyone walks in the hall or talks, you have to go and ask them very politely <laughs> to, to not do that. Which and is some people are into it and some people are not into it. And it really depends on who. David and I had to plan when we recorded to make sure that we could like ask folks to turn stuff down. We love you, CKUT. CKUT is amazing. Well, it's just, it's clearly just not made that because it's like, like the other funny thing about CKUT is like, you'll have um, a folk show on in the morning, which is very much just like mellow guitar folk. And then you'll have like the Palestinian show come on. And then you'll have like a hardcore rap show come on. And then you'll have, you know, the Filipino community show and then the Muslim community show, and then maybe a metal show come on right after that. Um, and that, that, that's free form radio at its finest. Um, and then I remember like you guys being in that booth and you know, you'd, you'd have to be recording an interview while Butcher T's noontime cuts <laughs> face is like banging on the on the window. He was so nice to us though. He was yeah. really nice to us. <laughs> a, a lovely human being. Uh, yeah, but that's the thing. It's like, it was always so nice to be there because it's such a special, like obviously like every place has problems and struggles, but it was like, it, it's such a special space where anytime you go, you're going to run into somebody. Someone's going to be doing something super interesting. There's going to be conversations going on that are really interesting. Uh, it just has a, a real energy to it that obviously is not happening right now, uh, but hopefully will be happening again soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's. I want to just triple the gratefulness for CQT. It's really a special place, and uh, like a lot of people don't have community radios that are able to just basically play a lot of leftist stuff all the time. Like I think it's pretty. We're we're lucky that CQT exists. Indeed, indeed. Um... Well, so we should say that we still broadcast the show once a month. Uh, over CKUT as a broadcast. Like we have a slot uh, that has uh, persisted somehow for almost six years, yeah. That's great. Um, so, so I remember kind of like one of the inceptions or like one of the ideas at the beginning of TRAPE is that you, you were also interested in doing kind of like Jewish media criticism. So looking at, you know, articles that had come up in Canadian Jewish News, RIP, um, or other such outlets. Um, and, and I'm kind of curious, like, how you came up with that idea and, and then maybe if you could talk about like how it's evolved since then. Mm -hmm. David, take away the evolution question. <laughs> sure. Okay. Well, yeah. So we started in that posture of just being like, we're just going to, me and Sam talk with each other and respond to this media world that enraged us to no end. You know, like every time that we would be at our parents' houses and we'd see copies of the Canadian Jewish News or the Jewish Tribune at the time, Actually, it's wild to think that both of those are now gone. That does yes. neither of those exist anymore. Now, um, now it's it's all about the Jewish record. Wait, what? What is the Bernie Farber outfit? Is it record? Uh, I don't even know. Yeah, we're behind the times. Uh, okay. But yeah, just just the consistent experience of seeing this and that, you know, representing a really hegemonic, uh, at that time, really hegemonic uh, presentation of what who the community was and what everybody believed. Um, and so instead of just like taking a Sharpie and writing <laughs> responses to it in our parents' copies, we thought it would be fun to just chat with each other. And there was a lot of reasons for that. Like one of it, one of the reasons was that we actually tried before the show as it exists as Trafe to uh, do another show, which Sam was talking about, which was more of a narrative uh, long form audio thing uh, of having the hubris to believe that we could do something like This American Life uh, being brand new to radio. Um, and we did an interview or two and it really quickly became clear to us that it didn't, or it just didn't feel quite right. 
Um, like we are in, putting ourselves in this position to tell other people's stories and acting as sort of like gatekeepers in this way. There was like all these things that we just weren't totally prepared to deal with the implications of. And it just felt much more intuitive for us to be able to talk about something that was about our experiences and our lives and speaking for ourselves, uh, which uh, ended up being what we did. Did you want to add to that, Sam? No, I was just, I'm just trying to remember the question and think about the transition. Um, but yeah, I think that the media criticism, I think the media has, the Jewish media has changed as well in the last few years. And so what maybe made sense six years ago in terms of like reading the Canadian Jewish news and being mad about the way they described some rally, uh, which is going to be every article in the paper versus now being like, oh, Jewish currents exist, protocols exist, uh, Jewish, like there's just different ways of thinking about and talking about Jewish news where I think in some ways now the questions are like, what are my similarities and differences with some of those leftist Jewish publications? Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to being like, there are no leftist Jewish publications, even though it's not like robust by any means, but it's much more, I think, than it was seven, six years ago. Yeah, and, I mean, we moved away from it because A, like the media cycle sped up considerably as we were doing the show. Um, yeah, that's, that's like 2016 Trump situation. Yeah, like yeah. before, <laughs> like when we started the show, there would be like, like every month, there would be like two or three stories that if we're really looking would sort of fit within the wheelhouse of the show. And then by 2017, it was like every week there was like over a dozen. Um, but I don't think that was unique to the little, like the beat that we carved out. I think it was going on across the board. Yeah. Um, and then also the sort of um, the dynamic of the, you know, the Canadian Jewish news or the Jewish Tribune being this hegemonic voice for the Jewish community in Canada, and, like, that dynamic in the Canada United States also seemed to be yeah. shifting, like the growth of groups like Jewish Voice for Peace, Independent Jewish Voices, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, the formation of If Not Now, like there are all these developments that really changed the public discussion, really changed how people were talking about things yeah. too. Uh, so it didn't really make sense for us to be, you know, responding to a dozen stories a week and saying things that other people are already saying. So we sort of shifted from that to actually talking to people who were putting into practice uh, politics that we had uh, some affinity with uh, in Jewish spaces. And so uh, we kind of called that period of the show mapping the Jewish left uh, internally. Uh, so we'd bring people on from all these groups and, and sort of introduce them to people who weren't familiar with them. And that was and, sort of phase two of the show. Yeah, so like talking to people like Ariana Katz, who's, who's a rabbi in Baltimore, um, talking to Aurora Levins Morales, although that overlaps with different things, but like we were trying to have conversations with the people doing the acting, the leftist Jewish practice, basically. Yeah, um, instead of just complaining all the time <laughs> about yeah. how these politics are so bad, we're like, oh, there are actually people putting these other politics into action and challenging these things. And so we yeah. decided to just become a platform for that. And so what's interesting with uh, today's incarnation of Trafe is you've gone from this like all these interviews with uh, you know mapping the Jewish left um, as you were saying and now what I find really fascinating is um, a lot of the content that, that we hear on Trafe now uh, in, in a certain sense I'm going to say has nothing to do with Judaism or Jews right so the the most uh, recent example or the most recent episode I should say and it, it's an incredible episode I was listening to it on a jog the other night uh, as, as people do when they, I uh, hope that didn't sound like a humble brag or something. But no, 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 it's cool, it's cool. People listen to podcasts when they jog. Um, but you had on uh, Skylar Williams, who's a, a land defender from Six Nations involved in uh, 1492 Land Back Lane. You've done interviews with political prisoners, some that are Jewish like David Gilbert. And you guys actually you know, drove down to where he's imprisoned in New York State and interviewed him, which I thought was incredible. Um, but also, uh, you know, people like, well, like Ashanti Alston, who's a, you know, former political prisoner. Um, and, and so I'm curious, talk a little bit about the, the content and the episodes where um, it, it's non-Jews on or that, that doesn't have anything to do with Judaism and, and how you see that fitting into Trafe and, and your vision of the show. Right. It feels like such a big question on the Jewish left. Uh, so 
I think we can, uh, how many hours do it's, uh, um, but I think that both of us feel like Trafe is a Jewish show because both of us are Jewish. Um, and it informs the practice. It informs who we are, it informs who our friends are, what we want to do, different things, like the whole, the whole nine yards. And so it's a Jewish show in that regard. Um, and I think we're coming, it's becoming clear to us that that's what this is. Um, and the other thing that really animates our friendship and is the politics that we share. And so it's trying to figure out how to engage with some of those ideas to the people who are already listening. Cause it feels like we've had a pretty similar, a steady amount of listeners for the last couple of years. And it feels, I mean, it feels, we, I feel so lucky uh, that people listen to us and we have a chance to talk to people about these things because in some ways it is just an exercise in learning more and connecting with people who have similar ideas. And so I, I just feel super lucky. I feel like in some ways being a radio host is like a chance to talk to really amazing and fascinating people. And um, yeah, David, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, I think there's the one, one element of it is the audience piece, which is that we sort of accidentally found ourselves with, like you're saying, like with people listening to us, which we didn't totally expect at the beginning. Um, and a lot of those people lived in the United States um, and were, uh, you know, in some way connected to the Jewish left or were Jewish and had leftist politics. And came, most of them came to the show. We were in that second period where we were highlighting all these different voices uh, do, in the Jewish left. Um, and once we sort of had that audience, uh, we started thinking about how to engage with that audience. Um, and, you know, the people who are listening are also involved in these growing movements that are active. And there's all these other political conversations that are happening. So uh, we sort of transitioned into uh, a way of thinking about the show that's having a conversation with that audience. Um, and if that group of people seems to be engaged in certain political conversations in the Jewish left, we can think about like, what's not being said? Like, you know, okay, there's, there's a rise in global fascism, but what are the ways that we think that's not being reflected on? So we had a series about, you know, fascism in the far right that kind of reached back to these different historical moments to illuminate it differently. Or, you know, we noticed that a lot of people are talking about the Jewish labor boon, but we noticed that you know certain things are being left out or, or certain things are being glossed over and so we decided to have a series in the Jewish labor bones um, and so most of most of um, what we do can also be understood through that lens um, as trying to sort of uh, fill fill the gaps as they emerge mm -hmm. so um, I'm gonna just ask a few more questions I have maybe like one or two deep questions and a couple like little like rapid fire questions um, but I also do want to uh, leave space for, for people tuning in to ask questions. We're going to have a Q&A period. Um, and so uh, there, there's a few ways that, that you can ask questions. Um, if you're joining us on Facebook, we're, we're live streaming on Facebook, you can drop a question into the comments there and, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, also, if you're joining us on Zoom, you can just write a question into the Q&A box uh, if you have a question for, for David and Sam. Um, also, what you can do is you can click the raise hand button, and then uh, we'll just call on you after, and you can ask a question uh, just live on your mic. You won't be on camera, just microphone. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about your listenership, because I think one thing that's like really interesting uh, if you compare radio to podcasts is... Uh, I did a, a radio show for, for over 10 years and it was really hard to get a sense of who was listening. And again, kind of the beauty of radio is it could just be really like anyone listening, right? Like um, I used to do overnight radio and there'd be like a lot of truckers tuning in um, and, and just that beauty of like discovering something. We know with podcasts, it's, it's not really necessarily like that. It's more like, like a niche focus audience, which in a way might be great for, um, a Jewish anarchist podcast that <laughs> yeah. might not interest every single person who stumbles on it uh, on the FM dial. But a cool thing about, I think, having a podcast that is very much geared towards a digital audience or digitally linked in audience is uh, you get a little bit more opportunity for audience engagement, whether it's 
um, you know, people sharing your stuff on social media, emails. Um, you guys also have a Patreon site. I know too, and Patreon's an interesting platform where you get a little bit more sense of uh, who your listenership is. Um, and another really cool thing about Trafe, I think, is it, it's become, I want to say, a household name for, you know, especially younger Jewish radicals, um, but, but really like Jewish radicals of any age uh, who are looking for interesting media and, and maybe, again, looking to have our ideas reflected uh, in a podcast form. Uh, so nowadays, it's, it's really nice just like talking with folks on, you know, the Jewish left and, and, and people know Trave. Uh, and so, yeah, I wonder if you, if you have a sense of who your listenership is and if you could talk a little bit about like how you've connected with them, maybe how they've influenced the show or how you think the show has influenced the Jewish left. Oh, wow. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I, um, or so go, go. I kind of wanted to talk about the, um, the workshops that we were doing. I feel like that's like the most uh, clear yeah, connection in my mind. Definitely. Definitely. Like, yeah. Is so at, uh, uh, I don't know how long, over the last few years, we haven't done it in about a year and a half, I think. Um, we had this period of time where through talking with people who are listening to the show and through things that they were sort of asking us for, um, we developed this workshop that we did, we never really thought we would be doing, uh, which had to do with uh, the way that anti-Semitism is discussed and understood, uh, specifically in Jewish left spaces. Um, and a lot of the ways that um, the sort of mainstream understanding of anti-Semitism filters in and where it comes from and the history and all these, all these different things that it's attached to. Um, and we ended up doing it in like, I think over a dozen different cities um, and traveled quite a bit. And so every time that we would go to a new city, we would actually, that was our only opportunity to meet people like in real life who had listened to the show and were sort of engaged in political work where they lived. And those relationships, like making, meeting those people and making those relationships more tangible was, was fan, like, it was amazing. And more than anything else, like made me feel so lucky to be a part of the project, like to actually, like I would never have met so many of these people. Like if you had told me before we started the show that I'd be like, I'd be buds with Aurora Levins Morales, like I would not have believed you. Like it's like, yeah, I, I just feel incredibly lucky. Yeah, and I think the conversations that we had, because these were long, 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 uh, <laughs> these were sometimes long workshops, depending on when we did it. I think we toned it down at the end, but it was a little intense at the beginning. It was three hours or something. But I think that there was there was so much back and forth that happened with people, and that informed not only the workshop, like David and I would change the workshop every time, but it definitely impacted the direction of the show and the things that we engaged with. Because I mean, like, Again, what you said at the beginning that people know who we are, it's humble, like it's it's at at root very humbling. Um, but also David and I really tried to make it a resource that people could use. And so if that's what's happening, it's really cool to know that. Um and also I just want to say that I've thought many times about the random person turning into CQT at different time slots that we've had <laughs> and trying to understand what was going on on our show. And it brings me a lot of joy because I know a lot of random people just, or not random people, a lot of people randomly listen to CQT. And there must be people who are just like, who are these weirdos who are talking about this stuff right now? Um, so, yeah. Um, so for people, so for the uninitiated, people who uh, maybe you've never heard an episode of Trafe before. If you had to- Probably Most people. <laughs> well, let's say if people haven't, um, yeah. humor me if you will. Uh, if you had to choose a, an episode that would be a really good starting point for people, uh, what would that episode be? So maybe David, if you wanna start. I would say, so we recently did a, an interview you mentioned with Ashanti Alston. Um, uh, and I would say that's a good starting point to get a sense of the politics and the perspective of the show. I was really, I was really proud of that interview. Um, David, I, David, who's Ashanti? Uh, Ashanti Alston was a former member of the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army, um, who was a political prisoner for over a decade uh, in the so-called uh, United States. Um, and he's just been uh, like an active organizer, activist at this point, uh, you know, like a movement elder. Um, 
and uh, has been involved with so many, like he's been involved in the Jericho movement, uh, who, which is an, an organization that is trying to end uh, the imprisonment of political prisoners in the United States. Um, he's been involved in efforts to support the Zapatistas, you know, on and on and on and on, um, and just has so much wisdom uh, and uh, insight to offer. Um, but I think, yeah, I think most of our, actually like our movement elder interviews act as a good way in. Like you mentioned, we, we interviewed David Gilbert, uh, Laura Whitehorn, uh, who's also a former political prisoner and was uh, a member of a lot of very inspirational, was a member of the Weather Underground um, and is currently active in, in the, uh, the rap campaign uh, to release aging uh, uh, people, people in prison, prison. <laughs> uh, in, in New York State. Um, Anyway, yeah, I, I just talked to this girl list interviews, but I think those are a good a good place to start. What, what do you think, Sam? I think the beginning, the, uh, sorry, not the beginning, the newest is probably the best move. It sounds weird to say that, but I think that that gives the best insight into where we're at. I mean, there might be some funny jokes in earlier uh, uh, shows. Yeah, don't Maybe listen not. to the early stuff. Don't listen to the early stuff. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Um, I think there was some interest, like, uh, this is... I've thought about what it would be like to listen back to some of those things and think about how they relate to the present, but that's like a whole other project. But yeah, no, I think, I think there are a bunch of, if, if you go on tradepodcast.com uh, and scroll through the full episode list. Nice plug, Sam. <laughs> um, there are, I think if you're like, if you're, the, the goal, again, I'm not saying this is the outcome, but the goal was to be like, a, was to make it a resource. So if you're, yeah, if you're new to this milieu and you have questions about a particular issue, if you search it and see if the keyword's on the site and hopefully there's an interview about it in some ways, I don't know, maybe I'm, anyways, whatever, check it out. Yeah. Or if you're just like totally don't understand what this show is, we have a Twitter feed and you just scroll down on the Twitter feed, you'll be like, oh, okay, I get their general politics. Yes, yes. Um, in a similar vein of things and maybe some overlap here, uh, if you each had to choose your favorite episode of Trafe, what would that be? Usually the most recent one. Um, uh, <laughs> but I-, I, I your favorite? It becomes your favorite as you go? <laughs> well, no, no, like each time. So it's like every time we release an episode, that is my favorite episode until we release the new one. Wow. Um, but, but with that being said, to give, to give some more concrete answers here, um, I think the Movement Elders ones, the with Ashanti, with Laura Whitehorn, with uh, David Gilbert, I felt really Aurora Levens um, Morales. Aurora Levens Morales. I just the chance, like like you both mentioned, the chance to talk to those folks was amazing, and I think that the insight and wisdom that we were able to record and then edit out and put together uh, is a really good a good listen uh, mm. as a biased creator of that media. Now. You guys haven't mentioned this, and maybe you're embarrassed of it, but my favorite episode is the War on Christmas episode. <laughs> Everyone should go listen to the War on Christmas. Um, if not just for anything, just so you could hear um, our friend Moish, who is a guest on that show, you know, talking about like Merry Christmas and uh, <laughs> all these weird, weird stories about. Christmas in Montreal in the 1960s and 50s and uh, yeah first and, and, and foremost to a Santa Claus parade um, kind of like as an anthropological <laughs> or something yeah we also early in the show a lot of stuff we did was just pure like weird comedy weird radio yeah. um, <laughs> like the version of the show now is like a pure interview show uh, so it's a little jarring sometimes for people, uh, especially when it just comes on the air on CKUT while people are driving. Yeah. Um, but that was really fun. If you want evidence of an extremely DIY approach to editing, that's uh, a little less methodical than you're talking about, Aaron. And I think the most important thing to note is that the, the Santa Claus parade that we were trying to go to in that episode, um, but failed and went to a different one, uh, the initial one that we had intended to go to, uh, it was canceled this year, um, which I think is ha within the broader context of the COVID pandemic, scary and sad, but with, in a jokey sense, vis-a-vis -vis the war on Christmas, it seems to be a success. Yeah. And if people have no idea what we're talking about, uh, the, the premise of this episode, it was a special <laughs> seasonal episode we made, um, was that you know, people talk about there being a war on Christmas when we were growing up, Fox News. And, and right-wing outlets would always talk every year about the war on Christmas from all these code words for liberal Jews. 
Um, and so we did this piece where the premise was that uh, we were sort of accepting that and we were actually partisans of the war on Christmas and we were looking at how we can get more involved in the war on Christmas. So we talked with all these different people and we went on all these adventures about how to sabotage Christmas in Montreal. Um, but it's it very tongue in cheek, like it's, you know, it, it's uh, kind of hard to understand <laughs> out, of, out of the context of the show at the time. Now, yeah. a segment that I've always wanted to participate in on Trave is one where there's this funny gap in terms of your knowledge and expertise as hosts, because uh, Sam, for those of you who don't know, or maybe you know because you listen to the show, is, is a hockey fan, and David is a punk rock fan. Uh, and and these, if you had like a Venn diagram, this would be a non-Venn diagram because there's absolutely no overlap. So when David brings up punk rock episodes, it does not resonate with Sam. And when Sam brings up hockey references, it does not uh, resonate with David. And uh, for, for me as a Jew, uh, both of those things are near and dear to my heart. So um, I thought maybe we could have a segment where it's like bringing the, the punk and, and hockey worlds together in, in a Jewy kind of way. Yeah, Aaron, you've been pitching this segment for five years. <laughs> bring, us, bring, us the, bring us the content, we'll do it. Uh, <laughs> we need to figure out what it is. Do you think it's like a punk, a punker who plays hockey or, or do you think it'd be more a hockey player who's into punk well, or, I mean, so, or, or something entirely different? We need to find like, like the Colin Kaepernick of the NHL, who is also a Jewish punk rocker, I think. It's gotta be wow, I think that the world is gonna end before that happens. <laughs> well, the, this, the punk thing makes me think about something you were saying before about like just being around for a while and people knowing who we are. Like something, like when I used to like uh, play in punk bands and we travel, uh, there was this thing that people would say in, in, in that world, uh, the sort of like political uh, DIY uh, punk world, uh, that like, you know, if you, if you are really nice to people and you do your dishes uh, and you just keep touring every year, eventually in, in you, eventually your band will, will be, be known as like a punk band and you will be playing bigger shows or whatever. Like it just leads there. Uh, if, you're, if you're able to do that work, um, that, that's something that's possible. And I feel like with the podcast, like similarly, like we've been, just been around <laughs> for like the better part of a decade now. Um, and just by virtue of doing that, and uh, so far, like not alienating tons of people who otherwise would be sympathetic to what we're doing. Like people just know about it by uh, sort of like power of momentum or something. Yeah, this is also the nice kind of insular, like the insularity that podcast gives you. And Aaron, I wonder what you think too, but David and I have joked for a long time that it's just really hard to hate listen to something. Like no one's gonna listen to a podcast for an hour if, they're, if they don't like it. Whereas if they see an article or see a headline, it's much easier to trigger your angry response or your internet response. That's mm -hmm. a little more challenging on radio. Although I, I, I do, there was a while where I was doing anti-fascist research and having to listen to a lot of um, that awful neo-Nazi podcast that- Oh my God. And taken down as like this hour has 88 minutes. I think it was called. I mean, they oh, don't- Oh, wow. Wait, one sec. You're not kidding. That's real? I don't think we should be plugging their podcast. No, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, they, they got run off the internet by anti-fascists, but there, there was a time where I was having to listen to a lot of fash uh, podcasts, uh, just yeah. to do the research. Um, so that, that was a bit of a hate listen. Um, I, well, here's, I have, here's hoping no right-wing people are listening to our podcast to yeah. uh, dox us. Uh, please don't. So I have uh, two more quick questions for you guys. And then I would really encourage uh, if, if people tuning into this have questions, you can drop them in the Q&A box. Um, or if you're watching on Facebook, just drop them in the comments and, and we'll uh, try to get to those in a bit. Uh, I'm wondering if, um, if you would be able Maybe you're not able to, but if, if you're able to, to tell us about some of the episodes that are in the works. Uh, oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, we usually have a rule of never mentioning what's coming up because it can always, because many, many, many times it doesn't happen, like something goes wrong. Uh, but these are secured, uh, yeah. which is that the next uh, episode that we're working on is uh, part three of our series on the Jewish labor boom. Uh, which is uh, like a revolutionary Jewish organization that existed over a hundred, so was started over a hundred years ago. <clears throat> and a lot of uh, younger Jewish leftists today are, are, are very interested in, in the legacy of the Bund. They were 
uh, anti-Zionist, um, they were uh, anti-capitalist, and so I think it has a lot of relevance for people. Uh, so uh, that'll be out soon, uh, uh, in the next few weeks probably, depending on how quick uh, we can get through the edits. Um, oh, and Sam, there was uh, the interview with Irena Kleptich uh, that we're gonna sort of fo like formally end the Boone series with, with too. Who is for, yeah, just like an OG of the Jewish left, um, poet, feminist, uh, radical, just like this wonderful person that we got to talk to last summer now already. Yeah, it's, it's a long, things are, yeah. Time, time is, is time has been wild. But yeah, so we're gonna then, that's gonna be, the, so those are the no, next two episodes. Um, and David and I are kind of working on how to move forward with the series approach. So we're not sure 100% yet, but yeah. Um, Looking forward to, to those. I, I really enjoyed the, the, the series on the Jewish labor boom. There's some really fascinating history. Um, last question that I have for you guys before we take some questions from the audience is um, you guys used to end your episodes. And I don't know if you still always do this where uh, you, you give a shkoya. So uh, I'm wondering if you could just explain what a shkoya is and then if you have any shkoyas to give today, because usually you guys are asking people or maybe each other for their shkoyas. I'm asking you guys if you have any shkoyas today. Yeah, sure. Um, so shkoyach is a segment on our show. It comes from the, the term yasher koyach. Uh, and basically it's, it's our version of a big ups, uh, uh, a thumbs up, thumbs down. We like what you're doing. We don't like what you're doing. I feel like it's a very uh, common occurrence now on most podcasts, um, but it's basically just like something we want to give a big ups to, whether like it's a person, an event, a book, Etc. And so David and I usually give a positive one, but sometimes we give give a negative one. And so that's kind of the overview of Shkoya. Yeah, we um, we uh, invented the anti Shkoya. Yeah, which seems like very much in line with with who we are and how we're relating to uh, this whole the whole religion and and the history of the religion. Um, but so David, what is your Shkoya for today? Um, I think I'd give two Shkoya. Uh, one of which is to Solidarity Across Borders, um, who are doing amazing work, um, really difficult work, um, really trying their best to raise enough money right now uh, to do mutual aid work for all the people without status who are you know, really struggling to make rent right now, struggling to find work, struggling with the, the you know, economic violence that comes with the realities of the pandemic, um, who uh, are not receiving, you know, are not eligible for things like CERB or not eligible for government uh, support. Um, and, uh, you know, massive shkoyach to the amazing work that Solidarity Across Borders continues to do supporting people uh, in very precarious situations. Uh, and the second, <clears throat> the second shkoyach, I'm sorry, um, is to uh, all the, everybody on the uh, expanding front lines uh, of indigenous resistance to the ongoing violence of uh, colonialism and genocide uh, by the government, uh, you know, government of Canada and the project of Canada, um, whether it's, you know, 1492 land back lane, uh, whether it's Mi'kmaq folks, uh, you know, being attacked by, by settler mobs trying to, trying to fish, um, whether it's, you know, uh, folks in Barrier Lake who put up barricades preventing uh, settler hunters from shooting moose on their territory, uh, you know, folks out west uh, getting arrested, trying to stop, uh, uh, you know, pipelines going in the territory. It's just all over, everywhere you look, it's happening. Um, so massive shkoyach uh, for all that work and to all the settlers who are doing work to support that resistance and to make it more possible. Um, uh, we, we, like you mentioned before, Aaron, we did an interview uh, with Skylar Williams from 1492 Land Back Lane. And um, uh, right now, earlier today, they were dragged back to court um, uh, in, as a part of the sort of like criminalization uh, of indigenous folks uh, just being on their own territory. Uh, and so they, they need some funds uh, to help with that effort. Uh, as you can, you can and if you go to the trafepodcast.com, you, oh, well, well. you can look at the show notes for the last episode. We have links to the fundraiser, but if you just write, you know, 1492 land back lane, go find me uh, into Google or some search engine that you're using that is more secure than Google. Um, you, can, you can find results of how to get uh, some cash to them if you have it. And Sam, do you have a shkoya or an anti shkoya? Oh no, I I um I think David mentioned so many things that are on my mind right now, which probably occupy a version of my shkoya. We 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 do a double shkoya. So for the purposes of that, I'm double shkoyaing that. Um, I think like um, just broadly for everyone who's fighting right now for a better world, it seems like a bonkers time, um, and everyone who's 
able to put time and energy together to change things. Big time shkoyach to you. Right on. Yeah. Right on. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, One sec, Aaron, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but thank you. Thank you and Emily for uh, organizing this and uh, this whole project. Like the shkoyach goes there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I did want to uh, leave some time for, for, for people to ask questions who are in the audience. And I'm going to turn it over right now uh, to Emily, who's going to uh, take it over uh, and, and take some of your questions. So over to, to you, Emily. Hey. Hi. Hello. Um, really been enjoying listening. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, so I'll go to the one in the Q&A first, uh, which is a big one, asking a deep and per personal question about your life journeys politically. Um, so this is coming from Gordon Doctorow, uh, and he's asking, I'm interested in getting David and Sam to explain how it is that you moved from your previous Zionist backgrounds um, and made a break into like more of a left and critical view of Zionism. What was that journey like for you? Uh, Sam, it's all you. Really? All right. Um, I'm try I'll try to make this as concise as possible, maybe. Um, but I think that I grew up with uh, a parent, my mom, who taught me to think critically and care about people. Um, and then once I left high school, where it was a mostly Jewish space, I think I just had more time to think about um, the world we were in and how people were treating each other. And um, I think it just came together by like op opposition of settler colonialism in Palestine was similar to resistance and opposition here. And it just felt like it just made, it made sense to me. That was the journey. Um, and I'm lucky that I had a pretty decent family to take, to not be super angry. And then friends in Montreal who were provided so much learning and space and yeah, I think that's what what did it for me. I don't know if David, you want to give your take or. Yeah, I mean, I think I think for me it was um, um, a lot of different things, um, like having access to uh, leftist propaganda at a young age via uh, the music I was listening to was definitely helpful. Um, whether it was the liner notes of like Rage Against the Machine albums telling me to read different things, uh, or whether it was uh, some of the <laughs> some of the things those books said, um, and uh, the kind of positions that punk bands would take, uh, and people would say at shows, and the literature that would be on tables at shows. Um, but also, I, I, I was thinking recently about this experience just because of what's going on at Six Nations right now. Um, but in uh, a year or two after the 2006. Um, beginning of the reclamation of Canestado, kind of, kind of um, I, I uh, found myself at a few demonstrations um, uh, in Caledonia and nearby to where everything was going on uh, because there was an effort to try to form an anti-Indigenous militia. Um, and the person who was starting this actually lived close by to where I grew up. And so there was, anyway, there was all this stuff that was going on at the time. And I remember being there and uh, it was one of the first times that I saw a Palestinian flag at a leftist demonstration. And I asked, it was, it was someone from Six Nations, and, and, and I asked him what the, like, the idea was behind the flag and like, why he brought it. And he explained about you know, their, their resisting colonialism and their resisting uh, the same thing in Palestine. And, and this is about ending colonialism. And I was just sort of like, got it. <laughs> like, it was a moment in which a lot of reading and thinking uh, and hearing from people much wiser than me in my life uh, all sort of came together. Um, so there are many different things that uh, that contributed to it, but I've, I've been thinking about that one more lately. Can I can I add to the things that contributed as well? I think older folks uh, in my life who had gone through it, like older Jewish folks who'd gone through it, uh, and being there, and maybe this is, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm thinking more about being older these days, or like I'm not 20 anymore, but... Um, I think that having older folks there to show you that like there's a, you can be 40 in Jewish and anti-Zionist or you can be 50 in Jewish and anti-Zionist and, and so on and so forth. Like there's something really, I think, helpful about that as well, that I think giving props to the people who came before us, even though we don't always agree necessarily on some things, like I think there's definite, I, I, I want to put that in there as well. I think that made it possible. Right on. Yeah. 
Yeah, I relate to that. Like learning that there is such thing as non-Zionist or anti-Zionist Judaism was a really big deal in my life also. Yeah. yeah. How did, I mean, can we, do, should we turn the question on to you? Do you want to share? <laughs> like... I can be real concise. Um, okay. I actually learned about Palestine before I learned about like settler colonialism here in Turtle Island. Um, yeah, I met some Palestinian friends and then we got real into that conversation and yeah, yeah, just uh, led me to like a, a number of questions that I, I hadn't ever had in my mind. I'd never questioned, you know, and and didn't have cause to question or didn't have inspiration in my life or elders and yeah. elder, like, you know, to, to inspire those questions. So, yeah, um, but then it was a long, slow process and, and I didn't learn really, really learn and integrate an understanding that I also live in a settler colonial state here for a really long time after that. So yeah, slow journeys. It takes yeah. a long time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I have a question that is kind of general, but just about thinking about like our practices around consuming media. And it's something that's been on my mind a lot because I've been trying to limit my screen time um, being in COVID and just having so much uh, on screens. And I'm wondering, like thinking back to the previous iteration of the podcast where you were really like sifting through more right-wing media or mainstream Jewish media and, and critiquing it. I really see a lot of value in that because I think it's so easy for me, I know, to end up in a media silo where I just read opinions that I kind of can nod along and agree and feel affirmed in. And so I'm just wondering if you have any like thoughts or even advice on on media practices that like can balance your well-being while also like encouraging you to be critical you know um like i it brings to mind like noam chomsky i know uh really commits himself to like reading and listening to right-wing <laughs> media and yeah. i admire that but i find that i'm like so limited in my capacity to do that um yes yeah. yeah, so i'm wondering like what your experience was like of of listening really listening and really paying attention to mainstream Jewish media. And it sounds like you're not doing that so much now. And I just want, wonder if you want to talk about like your decision-making around that. And um, yeah. That's a great, great, yeah. great, great question. Sam, I feel like you had a whole journey around this. Yeah, I mean, I've had, um, I think what you're saying is right. The concern of a media silo is real. Like we, if we are just on our Twitter and our Facebook and our Instagram and our friends, like we are going to be reading the same things. Definitely. Um, I also, and there's value in engaging with right-wing stuff online. But I think the question for me is like, do I want to do, like how much of it needs to be done really? Uh, and then do I want to be the person doing that? Um, and is it more valuable to be trying to engage with things that we can actually change? where it feels like, I don't think that, I don't know, maybe, maybe that was a step for, I'm thinking out loud a little bit, but yeah, I think that definitely be conscious of the media silo um, and not being stuck in it, but I also not sure that in diving headfirst into right-wing media is a solution to like political change. Um, David, how do you feel about this? Um, I, feel, I feel like I don't want to read it. Yeah. Um, right now at this stage of my life, um, I could probably create like an auto generator for most of it. Yeah. Um, and it, part of the experience for me of spending years reading everything in it for the show, which again is different than everything now, like everything now in, in two days felt like everything then in six months. So it's just impossible now. Um, but my experience of doing it before we were doing it for the show was that, especially with the sort of cycle of like controversies around things, uh, like whether it's about Palestine or whether it's, you know, all these things that always come up, it's always the same. It is never any different. It's always the same. And it's really boring. Um, and it's not really about anything like you can just like, so it gets to a point where are you going to learn anything new? Like when I, when I look through uh, my newsfeed sometimes, like when I think about whether I actually want to read and read a piece, uh, I often think about like, is the information that is here needed to further like mobilize me in what I am doing? Like do, or, or is it going to just 
give me more details about something that I'm already have the like narrative framework for. Like, is this actually useful for me or is this going to be demobilizing? Um, and uh, often like 90% of the time these days, it feels like the answer is that it would be demobilizing. Yeah. Um, and I think like, it just feels like a losing proposition. Like you're never gonna, you're always trying to catch up. Like there's always too much of it. I don't know. This is just my, my uh, the effects of having done it for too long. No, yeah. I mean, so I like I was someone who was obsessed with uh, following American media, like the American political drama for the last like 10 years, basically. And it to me felt like a TV show. Like it, it's just like my consumption of it was constant, but it was basically a TV show. Like I'm just always tuning in to see these things. Um, and David and I always had this big back and forth about like whether I was following the bouncing ball too much, like just the news bouncing ball. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and I think some of the far right stuff is like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to be what David said, but yes, the being more mindful about whether or not we're going to follow the bouncing ball, I think is about protecting yourself in terms of like self care, but also the politics of the show you're like, you're putting out there. Um, yeah. Also like, at least our Twitter feed for the podcast is endlessly full of the sort of like hot take thing where there's like a bad political article. And then in the next hour, there's like a dozen people on Twitter talking about why it's bad really quickly, like in a sentence. And then there's like a dozen more people talking about like nuancing those takes. And then by the time that's happened, you have a whole other crop of articles that's out. And I don't think, I'm not saying that it's not important to be like taking down bad political articles if you like, if you think people are actually engaging and reading with those and that you and your audience are those people, but that's not my situation uh, for most of the time. Uh, so I, and I, given the cost of it uh, on my soul, <laughs> I, I try to be very uh, um, careful about when I engage. Right on. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, thinking about if it's politically useful <laughs> as like a question before you dive into something. Yeah, yeah. Right on. Um, well, uh, we have a couple fun questions from Facebook. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. Um, shout, out, shout out Facebook. Thank you. A fantastic uh, global entity that does wonders. Uh, Boo, Facebook. <laughs> yes. Hello. Yep. Um, so one question coming from Rachel Braun is just if you're reading any good books right now, and if you want to recommend any any reading, oh, what, yeah. what reading is is nourishing your soul while you're you're Ooh. you're putting aside that you're not going to read the stuff that is demoralizing or useless. <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I am. Yeah, that's a good question. David, you want to take this away? I don't know what I what I want to share right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm um, trying to think of like what makes sense to talk about. Um, uh, what also am I reading? Fun fiction, if you if that's what you're reading. Oh yeah, no. Mm -hmm. I haven't Sam, read a yeah, book in like a about... month, I think. <laughs> wait, what? Wait, David, what should I talk about? So one of the things, one of the effects of the Trafe podcast workflow, at least on my life, and I know to some degree on yours, Sam, yeah. uh, is that there's so much that we have to read for the show there's this sort of stack. Like I actually have some stuff on my desk that I'm like, I ha like of things that I haven't read and it creates this dynamic where the other stack on my desk of things that I want to read is very neglected. Um, so right now uh, to talk about the things I'm neglecting is nourishing feels very disingenuous. <laughs> like I'm actually trying to get through the stack of things I need to read. And, and like, it's really interesting stuff. It's just not the type of stuff that necessarily is like, life affirming and like nourishing on a spiritual level. <laughs> it's kind of stuff that's like, oh, that's a really interesting history. Or um, uh, I didn't know that that happened <laughs> or something like that. So, yeah, the, 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 the like stack of things I'm neglecting, I think, is just a book or two or three books written by folks in the transformative justice milieu. And just it's something that over the summer I was became really clear to me was imagining the future and imagining ways of building different realities now um, is something that I sometimes neglect. And so 
I have some books. I've been reading some articles. It's aspirational reading right now because I got a lot going on, uh, but it's there and uh, it's like the next thing up. But I do not want to claim that I actually am reading it. Thank you, David. I agree. <laughs> yeah, but well, I can say like the things, the stack that I have here are things I'm like halfway through that I haven't finished is uh, an N.K. Jemison book that Sam gave me for my birthday uh, that I'm halfway through. Um, there is uh, a general theory of love that I'm about like two thirds through. Um, and the mind spread out on the ground by Alicia Elliott that I'm also like two thirds through. Uh, but hopefully once we're done the Boone series, it's like all I'm doing is finishing these books. Do you want to tell us like uh, a book about the Boone that you are reading? Or, or is oh, that well, the stuff it's, it's funny. So we've, so all the Boone uh, episodes, uh, all the Boone interviews are now done. Okay. So all the research that we had to do for the show for the Boone is now officially put aside. Uh, but we've been but doing David, there are, but there are people who people could listen to or, or read if they want. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Um, but I would say just uh, look at the people that we talked to for the Boone series. Oh, yeah, <laughs> we have very true. detailed show notes with all of our recommendations uh, for what to read. Um, oh yeah, that's totally another thing. Check out the show notes if you haven't. Like David and I spend a lot of time trying to add links, and sometimes it's just Wikipedia, but a lot of times it's like thorough or or things that we really feel um, complement the uh, show. We try to think of the show time. notes as sort of like a syllabus, if you're coming to the issue we're talking to cold uh, and we divide it into sections, uh, every, there's, there's anyway, highly recommend it. Uh, what, what website, David, would they need to go to to see that? Trafepodcast.com. Uh, right. But something that we found ourselves uh, thinking and reading and talking about uh, since the boon, and it's unclear if this is gonna make itself into a series, um, is uh, a lot of questions sort of about um, how we organize ourselves and what strategy is uh, for the sort of uh, revolutionary left political tendencies that we feel affinity with. Uh, and it feels like a much more fraught conversation to have with the format that we have. So still need to figure that out, but we've been reading and, and talking about that a lot uh, recently. That's hopefully coming up. Okay. Um, but do you have anything you, you wanna recommend that you're, that you're reading through right now? Yeah, Emily, yeah. Me? Oh, my. Um, I'm supposed to be doing a lot of reading for some research right now. Okay. Um, the book I'm enjoying that is sort of for that research is uh, is called I Hope We Choose Love by Kai Chang Tom. And it's, yeah. a, it's really like a lot of critique about uh, activist culture. Um, but it's also very visionary. She has a lot to say about what activist culture could be um, if it were more loving and less judgmental, or if that judgment could be expressed differently, I guess. Um, yeah, so I'm really enjoying that, that book right now. Um, yeah. Uh, there's another question here. I don't know how much y'all listen to uh, Jewish radical music, um, but Rachel was also asking if you have any favorite radical Jewish songs or, or maybe musicians. Oh, wow. Yeah. Putting you on the spot a little here. <laughs> I mean, I feel like Aaron is more of the expert, I, that, way more of an expert than I am. Um, uh, David, how can we shout out the crew in Sibylla? Uh, yeah, what about like the, the Dan KT, Dan world of music? There's many, many people uh, in our lives uh, scattered around uh, different areas, <laughs> north and south of the border uh, that we live near. Um, that make just like really beautiful music uh, and informed by the history of Klezmer. Um, but personally, I feel, yeah, I always feel like, a, again, like a bit disingenuous to be like, this is the music I listen to. Like I grew up in the punk scene. Most of the music I listen to is kind of from that world. Um, and like, I, I really appreciate the sort of like cultural spaces that those folks create. So like, just like a back, backyard show that happens here once a year after uh, Clubs Canada, that's really nice. And I always get to see a lot of people who are in from out of town. Um, and uh, I feel like those are like really special places to me. Um, but to be honest, like day to day, like that's not what's up. That's not what I'm listening to. Aaron, who should people listen to? Vivale, uh, amazing yes. fascist klezmer band from Seattle. And we had them for uh, a live event we did with the uh, IJV. When was that? In August. We're just like super sweet people with really yeah. solid politics also. <laughs> it helps, it helps. Yeah. 
I'm going to shout one out too, actually. I've been listening to some SoundCloud uh, and there's a the Queer Nagoon project uh, mm. that just has like gorgeous um, melodies. And Nagoon is a, is a wordless melody. Um, yeah, really beautiful. All right, um, Aaron, should we be wrapping up? Or do you wanna, uh, there's a couple plugs in the chat. Maybe you want to cover those? Sure. Um, yes. So uh, if, if people don't have any more questions, thank you so much for uh, everyone who uh, joined us today for this, whether it was on Facebook or on Zoom. Uh, just before we go, I, I do really, really want to recommend that people check out the next installment in this series. We're calling these the Firestarter Chats. The idea was like, bring on all sorts of people, whether they're podcasters, artists, musicians, community organizers, people who are really igniting the fires of resistance and inspiration. Um, and so the next one is gonna be next Thursday, October 29th with Rafif Ziada, who is an incredible Palestinian poet and spoken word artist. It's at 1 p.m. Eastern. And you can register again by going to our website, ijvcanada.org slash Firestarter Chats. It's up there. Um, I do also really want to recommend people sign our petition um, uh, th that is going towards the Ontario government right now that are looking towards uh, passing the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. It's really important we stop that because that is going to really serve as a, as a, as a weapon essentially to silence uh, Palestine solidarity and to uh, to essentially like rewrite the definition of, of anti-Semitism uh, to conflate it with anti-Zionism. So we don't want that. Uh, go go check out our website again, ijvcanada.org. A huge thank you today to to Emily uh, first for uh, being co-moderator and jumping on. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Emily, for being with us. I had a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. And a uh, huge thank you and shkoyach to um, Sam and David from- Thanks, Aaron. For doing this. It's been such a pleasure. Thanks so much. What's what's the website again for people to check out Trave? I don't know. What is it? You want All me? Right. No, no, no. I'll say it. Trayfodcast.com. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's it's uh, it's been a real pleasure, and uh, hopefully we'll check back in soon. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks, you too. Thank you both. Good night.